this to God. Let's begin with prayer. God, I thank you that we are in your hands. Thank you for bringing us all together, Lord, in fellowship and worship, in the common bond of your love for us and our love for one another. Lord, I do lift up Dave to you this morning, uh, that this uh, melanoma spot would be dealt with successfully for your honor and glory. Lord, we know where we're headed for eternity, but while we're here on earth, we have the opportunity to witness to people who aren't headed there right now. We can share your love. We can share the difference you've made in our lives, and then you can draw them to you. I pray as we worship you and praise you, you would be the absolute focus of it. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to see you. I want to ask you something. Have you ever tried to tell someone about Jesus and have them made fun of you? It happens, doesn't it? It happens. I want you to know something. It not, it's not just you. It's been happening to children for a very long time, hundreds of years. It happened to me when I was in school, which was not hundreds of years ago. But it happens all the time. And sometimes we don't know what to do about that. We might get angry. We might hide and decide we're not going to tell anybody anymore because they just make fun of us. And so we won't tell people about God. Sometimes we'll even deny that we know him. Someone will say, oh, you're a Christian. We'll say, no, I'm not. Well, we don't want to be that way, do we? We want to very humbly stand for God. We don't, we don't get mad at people. We just say, yes, I believe in him. And if they make fun of us, they make fun of us. What's important is that we let people know. But we also need to be prepared. We need to be ready for it because people will make fun of us. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, Paul wrote this. He said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That's all this stuff that we can do to prepare to tell others about Jesus and to live for Jesus and to take a stand when people oppose Jesus. He said that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And boys and girls, we live in times where there's a lot of evil. It can get and it probably will get a lot worse. So we need to be prepared. That means we need to talk to God all the time. We need to learn what the Bible says and we need to memorize parts of the Bible as much as we can. We need to practice telling people about Jesus. We need to stay with other Christians and we need to live by faith based on what God promises, not on what we think or others think. So I'm going to pray for you that you put on the whole armor of God. And you can read more before and after that uh, scripture verse I just read to show what those different parts of the armor are, okay? Let's pray. God, I pray for these boys and girls. I pray they'd do better than us, that they would take on the whole armor of God, that they would stand firm in evil days. They'd recognize that uh, people are not the enemy. People are the ones that need Jesus just like we need him. And Lord, just as there came a time in my life where I had to turn away from not following him to following him, I had to believe in him, that we'd recognize those people out there, so many of them are just waiting to become Christians. They may not even know it. And our job is to tell them about Jesus. And we do that. I pray that these boys and girls would grow up not backing away from their faith in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Isn't it incredible that a gospel opportunity can fit in your hands? It's called an Operation Christmas Child shoebox, and it's filled with fun toys, hygiene items, school supplies, and a personal message. But really, it's much more than that. It's a tangible expression of God's love to introduce Jesus Christ. Churches just like this, when they pack shoeboxes, have a significant gospel impact around the world. In the beginning, people from this village, they were hard-hearted to receive the gospel. The turning point was when we distributed gift boxes. I saw a great impact. After the distribution, many of children gave their life to Jesus and started with the greatest journey. The greatest journey is so impactful because it's the Word of God. I've seen Jesus putting hope upon the children. God is doing a great work. If you want something as a pastor where your people can get involved in ministry, something that has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ, I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in Operation Christmas Child? To me, it's a no-brainer.
I have seen firsthand how a shoebox is an opportunity and a tool that opens the door to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. These boxes open kids' hearts to the fact that there's people all over the world that love them, and what it shows them ultimately is that there's a God that loves them. This is one of many shoebox distributions we've been doing on the nation of Kiribati. We have brought tens of thousands of shoebox gifts, and even though it's August, uh, it's Christmas for these children. Scripture tells us, go throughout all ends of the earth and bring the good news of Jesus Christ to make fishers of men. That's what we've been called to do. And that's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Each year, around 11 million gospel opportunities are shared in over 120 countries. And more than 4 million children enroll in the greatest journey and learn to be disciples. The gospel is truly going to the ends of the earth. Your local church is having a massive impact, all because of the simple act of packing a shoebox. These shoebox gifts create an opportunity for entire congregations to fulfill the Great Commission. With every shoebox you pack, your church is empowering and training churches globally to share the gospel. This is truly the Great Commission in action. Oh. 
in John chapter 12 verse 42 and 43 this morning and the title it was the first working title and then I gave it another name that seemed less well less and then I switched back to that out of the closet there's all sorts of connotations with that but I'm leaving it there for now it's really on confessing Christ testifying Last week we talked about fearing, not fearing those, as Jesus said, who can kill the body, but so what? After that, they're done. They can't do any worse to you than just put you to death. He said, instead, fear God, who holds eternity in his hands, that reverent fear. And fear is a real thing. Uh, I was in the ninth grade, and uh, my sister Nancy was in the tenth grade. Her boyfriend, Alan, was in the eleventh grade. He came over to the house one day. I said, uh, Alan, he, he drove a Volkswagen Bug, a uh, yellow one. He said, uh, uh, I said, Nancy's not here. He said, I didn't come to see Nancy. I came to see you. I said, okay, what do you want? You know? He said, I want to go to the movies. I said, okay. So I go out to get in his car. He says, I'll pay for it. I'll even buy refreshments. That was good for me. So I go to get in his car. He said, no, I don't want to take my car. Uh, I, I want to ride bikes. I said, Alan, I don't, you don't have a bike. He says, no, but you have one and your brothers have them. Maybe they'll let me ride theirs. I said, okay. So we go and talk to my little brothers, the twins, and said, can Alan ride one of your bikes? And they said, yeah, if you break it, you got to buy a new one. He said, okay. <clears throat> so we rode our bikes off of the Palisades at Capistrano Beach down to uh, the coastal highway, Pacific Coast Highway, and rode it down to San Clemente, probably about five miles or so maybe a little more, to the movie theater, which happened to be just a block from where I had really grown up for several years, right next to the beach. And we went in to watch a movie. And, you know, there's different kinds of fear. This was one of those giddy kinds of fear that make you laugh. And then you can, it, this is what the movie we watched here. It should work here. call brave. What is brave? Let me demonstrate. Now, some men are afraid of girls. Well, that's silly. Girls can't hurt you. A brave man just sweeps the female right off her feet. Nothing to it. Some men are afraid of men. No red-blooded American boy should be afraid of men. <laughs> be bold. Be firm. And above all, be sure-footed. Some men are afraid of ghosts. That's kid stuff. Uh, do haunted houses scare you? <laughs> They're mortar, stone, and wood. <laughs> well, good, because you're going to spend the murder night in the Simmons house alone. Some men are afraid of their shadows. <laughs> Some shadows are afraid of their men. So what is brave? How should I know? I'm chicken. Just who do you think you are? A little pipsqueak like you fighting us in court? Just who do you think you are? Drop dead, that's who. All right, Luther, now just calm down. Calm! Calm! Do murder and calm go together? Calm and murder? He'd started as a roving reporter with murder on his beat. Now he's a raving reporter as he tries to solve the mystery of the secret passage, the blood-dripping portrait, the ghostly organist. In your 
chicken if you miss this movie. Now, that's a comedy, <laughs> obviously. And, uh, of course, it's Don Knotts, Barney Fife himself. And Alan and I went, we got seats right in the middle, about five rows back from the front. We wanted to take this thing in. We got there way early, so we saw all of the um, civil service announcements. Some of you might remember uh, announcements at the beginning of every movie, what happens if there's an earthquake or an atomic attack and what you do and all that stuff. And, and we got it all and, and uh, then also go out to the lobby for some refreshments and then the, the preview of coming attractions and then the 30 or 40, it seemed like, cartoons um, that would show the shorts. And then finally the movie. The lights were down the whole time. We could hear people coming in, but we were focused. We watched that thing. And yeah, we laughed and stuff, but a little bit. He said, uh, but most of the time we were scared good. <laughs> and we were even ducking down. We, we just, and we didn't want anyone to know we were ducking down because when the lights came up, we turned around and looked and the theater was packed. They're in San Clemente, California. It was packed and this ninth grader and that 11th grader, we were the oldest people in the theater. <laughs> and, and we were the ones hiding because we were afraid. And so um, we didn't want anyone to know that we were afraid. Uh, you know what it's like, because we, we went away from there, and, and we forgot about it, and we laughed and all that, because that fear was really kind of a temporary fear at, at the situations in the movie. It's still one of my favorite movies. I just don't like to tell people about it much, because it brings back nightmares of me hiding in the theater. But you know what it's like. You know what it's like to be afraid and not want people to know you're afraid. Uh, we, we're, we're that. And, and plus, fear is not a fun thing to live with. That those long fears of, of things, that dread and being afraid, it's, it's hard to live with. It's going to relate to the message this morning as we're in John chapter 12. When Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that triumphal entry, uh, the Gospels record different things. And John records him talking to the people and telling them, guys, talking to his disciples especially, they're not going to believe in me. People, they're going to see the truth. They're going to know the truth. I'm the truth. They're not going to believe in me. And he's true. Uh, he said in another place that the way to destruction is very wide and the gate to it is really wide and many there are that find their way there. You, it's easy to get to destruction. He says, but the way to eternal life is very narrow. The gate's very narrow and there's few that find it. So people just aren't going to believe in me. Then it says in John 12, 42 and 43, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Literally, uh, that first part, word for word, says, Nevertheless, indeed, even of the rulers, many believed in him. So that word authority or rulers, that's referring to leaders or chiefs among the Jews. They could be religious leaders, they could be civil leaders, or even in the political realm, or they could be like tribal or clan leaders. That these are people that, that had influence over the rest of them, and it says many of them believed. The synagogue, we've heard the name a lot, the word a lot, though, there's not complete agreement in it as to when and where they began. It's agreed that the word means bringing together an assembly, that that's what it meant was people coming together for the purpose of praying. And then later on, it became identified with a place. But originally it was an assembly, just like the word ecclesia, that's usually translated church. Ecclesia means congregation or assembly, and then it became identified with a building, like this building here. P people will drive down and say, that's our, my church, referring to the building. When in the Bible, ecclesia means those are God's people gathered together. Well, synagogue was the same way. It's a place where Jews would gather together to pray, especially when they were carried away into captivity. And then it became the place where they would gather. There's four phrases that I want to go through, four critical phrases in this uh, these two verses. The first one, it says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. And there's a, some controversy here because of what follows. Believed in him, that means they entrusted their lives, their souls, they accepted him as God's messenger, his teachings as God's truth, and they believed Jesus was the promised Messiah. It's the same word Paul and Silas used when they told the Philippian jailer, 
Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, in Acts 16.31. Now, it's, it's not a stretch then because uh, you remember Paul and Silas were in prison, right? It was midnight. They were singing praises. There was a big earthquake. Their, their shackles all fell off of their wrists and their feet, and the door swung open. So the jailer came down, saw that all the doors were open. The prisoners were freed. He was going to kill himself because if you were the jailer and you let any prisoner escape, you paid their penalty and you'd be tortured and probably put to death. And he didn't want to be tortured, so he probably was getting ready to kill himself. And Paul and Silas said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're all still here. They'd been singing praises, and it's basically they said, we haven't dismissed the service yet. Uh, we're all still here. Don't kill yourself. And he brought them up, and he said, what do I have to do to have eternal life? What, 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 what do I have to do to be saved? And that's where they said, believe in the Lord Jesus. The way they use that there is the same way they use it here in John chapter 12, when it says, many believed in him. If you take him and put in Lord Jesus, it'd be believe in the Lord Jesus, and it's the same way they used it here. And Paul and Silas were saying, that's how you have eternal life. That's how you save. So it's really not a stretch then to say that these religious authorities, they're in John 12, verse 42, had the kind of belief in Jesus that is necessary for salvation. And some people go, wait, wait, what comes next, though? So we'll get to it. The next thing is, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Fear is actually a word that means through, on account of, or because of. In other words, uh, they let the Pharisees, or more accurately, the power the Pharisees had, or the control they had over the people, uh, influence them to the point that they did not publicly acknowledge that they believed in Jesus as Messiah. And it might help us to keep in mind that though they'd been taught for hundreds of years that a Redeemer, a Messiah, was going to come, Nothing had happened. Oh, they believed it. There would be a redeemer. But nothing had happened. Uh, but it was in the scriptures. However, being human, they interpreted that, most of them, it appears, uh, to mean primarily they would be de delivered from their immediate problems, specifically the Romans. So that's what they were really looking for. Yet it hadn't happened. And then along comes this man, a plain, physically unremarkable man. The Old Testament says there'd be nothing about him physically that would attract anybody to him. And this man had an unremarkable resume of uh, being the carpenter's son and a carpenter himself, and that was nothing in those days. I, those weren't credentials for anything profound. And he's just proclaiming simple spiritual truths. There had not been an arrest, a crucifixion, a resurrection, an ascension. There hadn't been the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out in power. There would just been hundreds of years of someday God's going to send this Messiah. And here's this man now proclaiming convincing spiritual truth. And as Thomas had said to his brother Simon, could this be the Messiah? They didn't have the advantage of us looking backwards saying, well, of course it was. They didn't know that. This was all fresh to them. On the other hand, the Pharisees had been in power for at least 200 years, and they exercised that power forcefully. Even Rome tended to let the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was kind of their high court for the Jews, uh, usually over religious matters, but it was composed of the high priests and uh, the Pharisees, some member Pharisees and Sanhedrin, and some leading men among the Jews. And that was their high court, as it were. And the Romans tended to let the Jewish Sanhedrin govern the people as long as it didn't cause trouble for Rome and it didn't keep Rome from collecting taxes. It didn't break any Roman laws. There were no riots. Okay, you, you can do your thing and less work for us and just keep paying your taxes. Of course, if they caused trouble, there was always a death penalty. So, Now, these brand new believers, though they were leaders of the people, they were not mature Christians. I mean, how else could someone believe in Jesus but not but maybe be afraid of the Pharisees? They were not mature. We, we've had babies born in this congregation since I've been here. Quite a number, actually. It's been wonderful. And one thing I've noticed about all those babies when they're born, they're useless. They're absolutely useless. The best thing you can say about them is, oh, aren't they cute? They cry, I'm so glad they have parents who change them or preschool workers who will because 
Pastor Jim just don't want to get in there and do it. They don't talk. They just cry and they eat and they mess their diapers and they sleep. That's about as useless as you get. There are dogs that do more than that. Well, these people were brand new baby Christians. They couldn't do anything. They didn't know anything. They just believed that Jesus was who he was. But we sometimes expect them to be so much more than that, but they were brand new Christians. The next phrase says, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. The temple in Jerusalem represented the very presence of God. There was one temple. It was in Jerusalem. It represented coming into the presence of God. And you, you couldn't be un, unclean or unwhole. You had to be whole and you had to be clean to come into the presence of God. The synagogue, on the other hand, the buildings, they existed everywhere. Uh, they started uh, probably in the Babylonian captivity where the Jews could come and meet together and pray and maintain their spiritual heritage and their community heritage. And they could teach the younger ones what the scriptures meant because they now were in a very secular society. And so synagogues were everyone. They were a gathering place for the Jews. And it was in their eyes um, who, what their culture was all about. So to be denied... Uh, Access to the synagogue, that gathering place of the Jews, was in their eyes to be denied access to their culture, their traditions, their people, their faith. They would feel it was like losing their identity and becoming outcasts among their very own people. So it would take something very, very valuable in their eyes to cause them to give up that connection. And the people had said, anybody who supports Jesus or defends him, we're going to throw out of the uh, synagogue. And for that that man in John chapter 9, you remember the one who was born blind? And Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And, and it was so fresh to him, he, didn't, he hardly knew what was going on. He says, I don't know. I, I don't know. And they, so they went to his parents and said, is that your son and who healed him? He said, well, yeah, it's our son. And yeah, he was born blind. But as to who healed him, you can ask him. He's an adult. And the Bible says they said that because they were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. So, meanwhile, their son, the, the formerly man who was blind, the former guy used to be blind and was now healed, he encountered Jesus again, learned a little bit more about Jesus and all this. And Jesus talked to him. They got that guy. They got the formerly blind guy and said, who did it and all this? And they raised a stink. And that's when the guy says, boy, this is remarkable. Um, you guys know all this stuff. And here's this guy. And all I know is I was born blind, but now I see. You figured out. And they threw him out of the synagogue. He lost his identity. And you know what he did as a response? He went around rejoicing. Why would he rejoice? Well, he was blind and now he sees. It was more valuable to him because the synagogue hadn't done him a whole lot of good, frankly. And he had lost being able to sit and be Jewish with just other Jews, which is not a bad thing, by the way. It was a good thing, that, that cultural connection especially. And he'd lost that. But now he was whole, and you know what he had access to? The temple. Before, when he was blind, he technically couldn't go to the, into the temple because he was not whole. He had a defect. But now he could go into the presence of God himself. So the presence of other people or the presence of God, for him, was an easy trade, easy decision. The fourth phrase is really the kicker this morning. That's in the, uh, the second verse we're looking at. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This will only be a, a problem for us if we understand ourselves in the context here. Do we love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God? That word glory means a good opinion or favorable opinion. It's, it's always good in the New Testament. It means praise and it means honor, as well as, as it's translated glory. They, 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 they wanted the, the approval of other people more than they wanted it of God. In the Jewish mind, your, your, back then, your worth, uh, I might add, in the Christian mind today too often, what others thought about you was directly tied to your standing among your people, and that in turn was tied to the synagogue, which was controlled in large part by the Pharisees. If they rejected you and cast you out, you couldn't help but feel that all Jews would reject you and you would be a disgrace, a non-entity. Let's face it, if you were thrown out of a church that you belonged to and they threw you out over uh, something as horrible as 
you help someone on Sunday uh, and you were cast out, you would feel rejected, uh, maybe even a non-entity. So to be accepted by your Jewish brethren and have a good standing in the synagogue was of utmost importance. It gave your life worth, value, and glory. Uh, and they, they crave that more than glory that came from God. Again, these were what kind of Christians? Mature or baby? They were baby. Was it a sin to be a baby Christian? No. When you're born again, you start as a baby. It's not a sin. It's a process. Uh, believe it or not, when I was born again, they didn't ordain me. Matter of fact, they didn't ordain me for a long time. <laughs> they, they couldn't believe that God had called me into the ministry. <sighs> they knew me too well where I was growing up. So there were those who believed in Jesus, but they didn't let anyone know about it. Nevertheless, the Bible says they did believe. In John chapter 3, Jesus encountered a man. What was his name? Nicodemus. In verses 1 and 2, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's quite a statement. And there's been lots of things proposed as to why he came to Jesus at night. Apparently, if we needed to know the exact uh, reason, God would have given it to us. But that's what he did. And then in chapter 7, in verses 50 and 51, it says, Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, verse 47 says it's the Pharisees, Nicodemus said to them, the Pharisees, because Jesus was in trouble at this point. They were wanting to kill him. They were just wanting to take him and beat him and, and just do horrible things to him, even secretly if they could. Nicodemus, who had gone before them, who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Have you ever tried to take a stand without anybody knowing what you're really standing for? Defend someone without defending them but trying to get the people to change their actions? Someone's going to beat up another kid and, and you want to defend this kid but you don't want to get beat up so you say, hey, do you guys know that we can all get expelled from school if we beat up someone? So you try to accomplish your purpose without letting them know what Nicodemus was doing that right here. Uh, but at some point in their lives, these people who did it secretly, they did not confess, They, those who believed did not proclaim it, they had to choose whom to follow. It's true today. Who is going to influence them the most? If you go to John chapter 19, verse 38, Jesus had just been crucified and he had died on the cross. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. This was a very big thing to do. He had to do this publicly. They didn't remove Jesus from the cross and put him in the city morgue, and then Nicodemus go through the back door and put him in an unmarked car and get him away somewhere where no one could know. Jesus was hanging on a cross in the public square of execution, and everybody knew it. And to take him down it was done out there in the open and to remove him. Uh, matter of fact, in Mark chapter 15, verse 43, it identifies Joseph this way. It says, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking for the, forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Amen. Now, that boldness must be related to both going to the Roman governor, Pilate, and exposing himself to the rest of the Sanhedrin as a believer in Jesus. The very next verse in John 19, verse 39 says, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. This would have been in the daytime before the sun went down because they had to do all this before the sun went down because that would start the, the Sabbath, uh, Saturday. Here Nicodemus, or as I like to refer to him from John chapter 3, Nick at night because he came to Jesus at night, uh, Nicodemus came out from being a secret believer and he joined Joseph and Arimath uh, Arimathea in the public arena as a follower. They had to decide who had greater influence. They had to decide to stop being secret followers. They had to acknowledge that following Jesus was worth the risk and more important, 
that the glory they might receive from people was not as great as the glory they, that they would give to God and receive from God. Uh, and, folks, it's a step every single one of us must take. We have to weigh what other people think of us with what God thinks of us. It's that simple. Uh, Jesus said in, in what we studied last week, don't fear the people that can do damage to you on this earth. Fear God who has eternity in his hands. Amen. Eternity's coming. And some of us know it better than others because we're closer to it. I didn't think much about it. I knew eternity and all that, but when I was a kid growing up and, and an adolescent and stuff, yeah, eternity's out there and it's important and all that, but I didn't have uh, as, as much attachment to it as I do now. I know I'm closer to the grave than I am the cradle, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm 69, so yeah, I'm getting up there. Well, make no mistake, we are saved. We're born again. We're redeemed. We inherit eternal life when we believe in the Lord Jesus. That's what Paul and Silas said. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's what the thief on the cross did. Did the thief on the cross do anything to earn his salvation? No. <laughs> Was he even baptized? No. No. Oh, I imagine there's some denominations and cults that have baptized him many, many times in proxy, but no, he wasn't baptized. But believing is only the beginning. How many of you wish you were still a newborn baby? <laughs> Kids do. They wouldn't have to do chores. Babies don't have to do chores, but they can't do anything. They can't even focus their eyes very well. Our new grandson is starting to be able to focus on his eyes on mommy and daddy and things like that. And he's, what, a couple months old? Babies, they can't. I would not want to be a newborn baby again. I like growing. I like learning. I like discovering. I like doing things. But you know what? As a Christian, being a newborn is good because that's the only way you know, you start off, but it's not a good place to stay. It's only the beginning. Three things. One, you can believe in Jesus secretly. We just saw that, didn't we? You can believe in Jesus secretly, but you cannot follow and obey him secretly. You can't grow in him secretly. It, it can't happen. Because Jesus said, go make disciples of all people. Well, if you're going to make disciples of all people... You can't do it secretly. Secondly, you can acknowledge God to yourself secretly. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. But you cannot acknowledge him before men secretly. I want to tell all of you. I'm not going to tell you. It doesn't go together, does it? You can't acknowledge God before all men secretly. As we read in last Sunday, Jesus said in Luke 12, 8 and 9, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And I, I want to be the first to say this. I don't get all of this. I, I don't get all of this. I can't make all the arguments. I haven't met anyone who really can. I, I've met people who do make arguments, but none who convincingly took away all of the questions with, oh, that's it. Third, you can fail God time and time again, but he will never fail you. 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul said to Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. It's who God is. It's his character. He doesn't follow our lead. Don't you wish God would follow our lead sometimes? Don't, don't you wish he'd take our advice? Seriously, I mean, we say, I mean, with our intellect, we'll say that. But truly, if God followed my lead, I wouldn't have any mortgage payments left. I wouldn't have any debt. I would have everything if God would just follow my lead. But I'm so glad he doesn't because his ways are perfect. And he's always faithful, even when I'm not. You know, these guys who believed but not publicly because they were afraid, 
They never did anything for the kingdom of God as secret, unknown, in the closet believers, nor will you. At some point, you must, one, openly confess Jesus in order to do something for the kingdom of God. Quit worrying about what others might think or do when you know you are in God's hands. Amen. That's what Jesus was saying about fear him who holds eternity there. Well, number one, openly confess Jesus. Quit worrying about what others might think or do when you know you are in God's hands. And that comes from John 10, 28 and 29. I give them eternal life and they will never die and no person can steal them out of my hand. My father gave my sheep to me. He is greater than all and no person can steal my sheep out of my father's hand. Now Jesus is saying that. He's saying this. His children, people who believe in him, are in his hand. Amen. And it can't be taken away. No one can snatch you out of God's hand. No one. So what are you worried about? Secondly, become active in following and serving the Lord. At the end of his long life, Joshua, who took over for Moses and led the people in the promised land, and they conquered, and they did this, and they got land, and they distributed it, and all this. Right before he died, Joshua said this in chapter 24, verse 15, because the people had already begun to put God behind them, as it were. And Joshua said, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or Egypt, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, the promised land. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The whole book of Leviticus is about this, by the way. God says, I'm holy, you're to be holy. Don't do what they did in Egypt when they didn't follow me. Don't do what these people that were in this land before you did uh, or the land you're going into because they don't follow me. And if you do what they did, people are going to think you're one of them. You be different. Be peculiar. Be odd for God so that people will know you belong to me. And that's enough reason. Don't imitate them. Imitate me. Be active in following and serving the Lord. This morning, you might be one that says, boy, I'm glad I don't have to do any of that stuff. I don't believe in Jesus, so I don't have to be bold. The problem with that is, if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't have eternal life in you. Your sins haven't been forgiven. And you're facing an eternity in what Jesus called a lake of fire that never goes out, and you'll be punished or tortured, as it were. You'll be in torment, really, forever. It'll never stop, and you're not going to be with plenty of other people. I've heard this, and you've heard it too. Well, if I go to hell, at least I'll have a lot of friends with me. No, you won't. Jesus gave us a picture of that when he talked about the rich man and Lazarus. And when they both died, the rich man was in the lake of fire, and there was no one with him, though there's billions of people who've been there and are going there. But he had no companionship. All he had was eternal regret and sorrow and torment he wanted just one drop of water on the tip of his tongue and it would mean everything to him and he couldn't even get that that's the destiny for anyone who doesn't acknowledge their sin to god and ask him to forgive their sin and turn their life over to him believe that jesus died to pay that price for them you can do it this morning i want to encourage you to do it in a moment we're going to be singing a song and i'm going to stand up here if you'd like to just talk about that matter of fact let's make it easy when you sing, I'm just going to go over there and sit at a table. If you want to come over and talk about giving your life to God, I'll be over there and, and we can discuss that. And I can make sure, help you make sure you know how and why it's important. If you've already done that, this next step says, This week I will pray. You're going to talk to God. Asking God to show me when I have an opportunity to let someone else know that I believe in him. Because when you're in your room all by yourself, that opportunity is not there. But an opportunity to pray is and to get the courage. But when you're out there at, at the workplace or the marketplace or in the neighborhood or school or wherever else, and you run into someone, God may give you that opportunity. You may not have it, but ask God to show you when you have that opportunity so you can just say, can I share something with you, the greatest thing that ever happened in my life? And just share your testimony. It can be very brief. My life was just a mess. And then I, let, I just turned it all over to God, and he took it. He forgave me of every wrong thing I've ever done, and I've been following him ever since, and it's made all the difference. And I just want you to know you can do it too. Now, that took about 20 seconds.
you got 20 seconds to give God and for someone else this week. Are you willing to do that? I'd encourage you to check that off if you are. Let's stand and pray. Father in heaven, I pray. If there's anyone here, God, who has been living their Christian life in the closet, which means they're really not living it, they're, they're staying a baby, that this morning they'd come out of the closet spiritually and they would say, all right, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk according to God this time. I, I'm going to follow him. If people know it, if they, if they look down on me, then they look down on me. God, they, it's never as bad as we imagine, but it can be. But God, I pray we'd be willing to give our lives for the gospel because our eternity is secure in you. God, help us to be bold for you and not afraid of the world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.